so we called the first, our first panel Electrifying the Energy Code, and it'll be moderated by Molly D. Ramasamy from JBNB, and it will feature Diana Burke from New Buildings Institute, Emily Hoffman, the Director of Energy Code Compliance with the New York City Buildings Department, and Chris Corcoran, who leads the codes team at NYSERDA. So come on up. Um, so to get you in the codes mood, we have invited Diana Burke to kick us off with a brief presentation about NBI's Building Decarbonization Code, which is an overlay of the 2021 Energy Code, and she's going to explain all this to you. So, Diana. It's so I, I feel so honored to be here today and grateful. I haven't been to an in-person conference in over two years, and it's just fabulous to be with you all. Um, my name is Diana Burke, and I work at New Buildings Institute. We are a nonprofit based in Portland, Oregon, laser focused on getting our buildings to net zero carbon emissions. I'm on the policy team, so when we try and come up with policies to get our buildings to net zero carbon emissions, we believe we have to draw on a number of strategies. We uh, obviously energy efficiency is one of the most important strategies we have to employ because it's the most cost effective way to get to net zero carbon emissions. We also have to think about how we power our buildings. Obviously, we want to power them from renewable energy, which is carbon emissions free. When we build our buildings, we also have to think about grid integration and storage techniques. So our buildings use that renewable energy when it is available, and our buildings do not contribute to the peak of the grid when our foss fossil fuel peaking power plants have to turn on. Finally, the reason we're here, we have to think about building electrification. So we stop burning, burning fossil fuels in our buildings that emit carbon emissions. And then finally, we have to consider life cycle impacts like embodied carbon. Now in our decarbonization code, we focus on three of these strategies, uh, renewable energy, grid integration and storage, and of course, electrification. The decarbonization code is part of a larger toolkit, which is a nation, part of a nationwide partnership between NBI and the Natural Resources Defense Council. It includes three major pieces. First, technical resources, which is including our building decarbonization code, which is code language written to require buildings that are new to decarbonize. We are currently working on an overlay a, for existing buildings to get combustion equipment out of our existing buildings. And that will be released later this summer or early fall. Included in our toolkit are a few one-page fact sheets and a cost study, which I will talk about later in this presentation. And then finally, an advocacy framework. So what is an overlay? Why an overlay? Well, our decarb carbonization code is built as an, an overlay or suggested changes to two of the most commonly adopted energy codes across the country, the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code and ASHRAE 90.1 2019. We chose these two codes because the, they are the mo most recent codes which cities and states across our country are currently considering for adoption, and they are the most efficient codes to date. So we believe it provides that strong efficiency foundation. We also chose these codes because states and cities are familiar with the process of adopting these codes, and during those processes, they often consider amendments to change the requirements in these codes. So this overlay can be sort of a cheat sheet for how can we amend our state code to get to zero carbon emissions. And then finally, we chose these two codes because they are also updated on a regular basis. Emily and I currently are on the committee to determine what the next IECC, the 2024 IECC, will look like, and I'll talk more about that later as well. So how is this overlay structured? Well, as I said, our current decarbonization code overlay is focused on new construction. It includes requirements for both residential and commercial buildings. And it, it includes two steps for jurisdictions, two choices. Um, for jurisdictions that are not quite ready to require their build, new buildings to be all electric, we have language that would allow them to require their buildings to be electric ready. 
still installing combustion equipment in their buildings, but at least having the electrical infrastructure in place. So if a building owner later down the line wants to replace their combustion equipment with electric equipment, they can do so without having to do a major retrofit. So for a heat pump, it includes requirements, for example, for uh, a space and an outlet for a future heat pump water heater. Um, the second step is for cities like New York City that are ready to require electrification, ready to require new buildings to be all electric. Uh, so we include code language for that as well. The key areas for electrification that we consider in these two codes include uh, electrification readiness or all electric requirements for heating, water heating, cooking, and lighting. As I said, we also include other, the two other strategies I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we include requirements for renewable energy uh, and storage, uh, transportation electrification requirements, so EV readiness requirements, and finally grid integration requirements. On renewable energy, we have sample language that jurisdictions can adopt that would re require commercial buildings to inst install a nominal amount of solar on their buildings of, of about 0.25 watts per square foot. For residential buildings, the language would require those buildings to be solar ready. We also have energy storage readiness requirements for new construction uh, for commercial only. For EVs, we have EV charging equipment, EV capable requirements or EV ready requirements for commercial buildings, depending on the occupancy type, a certain percentage of parking space that, Parking spaces either have to have EV chargers or be EV ready or EV capable. For residential construction, we require parking spaces to be EV ready, meaning there's an outlet for a, a level two charger for that uh, house. And then finally, we include demand response requirements. So when we talk about demand response, we're mostly talking about making sure water heaters can be grid interactive and thermostats can be grid interactive. So we developed that, those requirements and released that code about a year ago. We released an update in August, and recently, a few months ago, we released a cost study that we conducted to determine how costly uh, these requirements would be for a jurisdiction to adopt. We conducted this cost study in Climate Zone 5A, which is New York City's climate zone, it's very relevant to New York City. We analyzed two types of buildings, single family buildings and an, a medium office building. And we tried to figure out how, what the cost of the requirements would be for building an all electric or an electric ready building that met the requirements in our decarbonization code. For the single family building, we also conducted energy modeling and did a life cycle cost analysis to determine what the cost impacts would be for homeowners if you were to require electrification or electric readiness. We examined the life cycle cost analysis using a range of utility rates, and because we were in Climate Zone 5A, and New York City is in Climate Zone 5A, we looked at New York's utility rates and uh, found there was a range uh, of utility rates that you have in New York State. In New York City, for example, Utility rates are on average 23 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, in upstate New York, utility rates are around 18.6 cents per kilowatt hour. And then in both areas of New York, you can sign up for time of use rates, which actually overall reduces your electricity rate and is on average 13.6 per cents per kilowatt hour. So we analyze those three utility rates and um, we also analyze the carbon emissions of that single family building. And we found that in New York State in particular, that single all electric single family building did reduce carbon emissions drastically compared to in a building built to the code that had combustion equipment over the lifetime of that building, assuming that New York State meets its renewable targets, that single family building would reduce carbon emissions by one sixth of that mixed fuel home over the analysis period. So it's quite a big carbon emission reduction. We also, by the, by the way, found that that all-electric single-family home was less expensive to construct than a home with combustion equipment. 
And this was, can be a little bit surprising. Usually you think when you make codes more restrictive, it makes things more expensive, but in this case it did not. And that is because that the, com the mixed fuel home that has that combustion equipment needs the natural gas piping, natural gas meters in the home, and when you remove that infrastructure in the home, it actually saves the home, the construction costs quite a bit, between $7,500 and $8,200. Um, it's cheaper to construct. We did not include the natural gas infrastructure outside of the plot line, so what the utility would construct, but we did consider the infrastructure within the plot line and within the building. Uh, when we analyzed the costs for an electric ready home, of course, those costs did increase compared to the baseline home, but not substantially. It was only $1,000 to $1,800 more to construct a building that had electric inf the, uh, outlets ready for your heat pump water heater or your heat pump for space heating or your EV ready outlet for your electric vehicle. Um, including the demand response and solar ready requirements. So it was not that expensive. Uh, when we analyzed the life cycle cost uh, over the analysis period, which was a 30 year analysis period, we found that the life cycle cost obviously depended on how much you were paying for electricity. Uh, if you were paying a typical or time of use rate, which was 18.6 cents per kilowatt hour or 13 cents per kilowatt hour, we found that over the analysis period, those homeowners saved money, around $850 to $16,000. Um, if the homeowner was paying that higher fixed electricity rate, we did find that those homeowners did end up paying a little bit more over the analysis period, about $5,600 more. Uh, we also analyzed the cost impact for a medium office building. Um, when we did that analysis, we found that the most costly requirement in our decarbonization code was the EV requirements. In our decarbonization code, we stated that office buildings had to install EV chargers in 20% of the parking spaces, and 40% of the parking spaces had to be EV capable, meaning there is electric infrastructure for them and conduit going to the parking space, but no wire or outlet. That cost for that medium office building was on the order of $10.70 per square foot, so it's quite substantial. If you don't include the electric vehicle readiness infrastructure requirements, the other costs for electrification were quite reasonable. All electric, the all electric medium office building with renewables and man response requirements uh, were, was only slightly more expensive to construct, around 33 cents to 50 cents per square foot. Um, for the mixed fuel home or the uh, mixed fuel building or the electric ready office building, those office buildings were again slightly more expensive than the all electric building, but again very reasonable. They're around a dollar, dollar to a dollar twenty, dollar a dollar to a dollar twenty twenty cents per square foot more expensive. Um, I NBI and um, Emily. We serve on the committee to try and see if we can get these um, requirements into the national model codes. So currently we're on the committee for the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, which is adopted by many states across the country. And we are trying to, we introduced these requirements as proposals in October and the committee has been considering them for adoption into the next version of the code. Um, here's a status of where we are. We're not quite through the process. The committee plans to re release the draft code in August and the final code won't be final for another two years. But so far, the full committee has passed electric ready requirements for residential construction. They're voting today actually on electric ready requirements for commercial construction. They have we believe that the, both the residential and the commercial code will have an optional appendix requiring all buildings to be all electric that jurisdictions can adopt. Both committees have passed EV charging requirements uh, for residential and commercial. Uh, they have also passed, commercial has passed mandatory renewable requirements for the next version of the code that 0.75 watts per square foot for commercial buildings. 
That did not pass in residential, unfortunately. It failed last week, but we introduced solar readiness requirements and we're hoping that will at least pass. Uh, the committee has considered and passed many demand response requirements and um, energy storage ready requirements for commercial. We're still waiting to see what the residential committee will decide. Uh, NBI has also been working with states and cities across the country to introduce our decarbonization code throughout the past year and a half. Um, in Vermont, Vermont is updating their code to the 2021 IECC uh, and a little bit stronger actually, and they're considering electric ready requirements. We're working with Washington DC right now and their uh, code development board just uh, passed requirements to require all electric re residential construction using our decarbonization code. And they're considering the same for commercial construction. Illinois is adopting a new stretch code. We're hopeful that some of our decarbonization code requirements will go into Illinois stretch code. Minnesota has passed um, mandatory renewables. Denver is moving uh, towards electrification and is using many aspects of our decarbonization code in their new code. Um, and Washington State and California are also adopting many of these requirements. Um, and that brings us back to New York. So what is New York doing? Well, NYSERDA uh, released a request for information for New York stretch code concepts, which made a reference to NBI's decarbonization code in the solicitation. And when they received comments, about 40% of the responses to the request for information were related to decarb overlay topics. So we believe New York versions of many of these measures uh, are under consideration for New York stretch and other state code applications. But I'll leave Chris and Emily to talk about that more. Thank you. Thank you for that, Diana. That was great, great overview. And thanks to everybody who's in the audience this afternoon for joining us. It's great to be here in person, um, enjoying each other's company to talk about some really important topics today. And so I think we're gonna get right into it. We have plenty to cover here. Um, I have some initial questions I'm gonna ask our panel here, and then I'll actually reference the audience questions uh, once we get through these initial, and we'll go from there. So to jump right in here, Diane, I wanna start with you since you just gave that great presentation on uh, the decarb code overlay. And you briefly touched on it, but I wanna come back and just do a little bit more uh, around what uh, an overlay is and how jurisdictions might use an overlay in their typical code process. Is this on? Okay. Uh, so when states and jurisdictions adopt a code, <clears throat> they usually use some sort of process that involves um, a technical committee looking at the new code that they're adopting, and they usually involve some sort of process where they consider amendments to the code. And so sometimes the processes are public, and public, the public can um, submit amendments um, and so we've done that. We've submitted these amendments to several states and cities across the country when they're adopting the latest code. Um, and sometimes the process is uh, funded by the state or city, uh, similar to how NYSERDA adopts their code. And usually a technical, technical group will develop a draft code and then release it for public comment. Um, so it depends on the process, but usually states I think the vast majority of states across the country adopt some version of the International Energy Conservation Code for residential and commercial buildings. Some states adopt ASHRAE 90.1 2019, um, and some states adopt ASHRAE 90.1 2019 by reference. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. And Chris, I think you had a point on this topic as well that you just wanted to briefly touch on. Just a quick point on that. Um, if uh, we wish that uh, it was as easy as just in New York State as just taking the code and, and adopting it. Um, unfortunately, because of the underlying laws related to codes, it's more complicated than that, of course. It always is. Uh, because of that, uh, what we've started to do is to look at you know, pulling it apart, figuring out where this, you know, each piece can fit. Could it fit in energy code? Could it fit into other uniform codes? Uh, but uh, I, I, this is one of those situations where I wish it was something we could just take straight and, uh, and adopt for the state. but. Unfortunately not. Understood, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and so to kind of go into the details of this particular set of recommendations and the decarb overlay, 
Um, this concept of electric ready seems to be fairly present, right? This idea of maybe a two-step process to getting to electrification uh, within new, new construction. Um, uh, Chris, I'm kind of curious to know from the NYSERDA, from the state perspective, this idea of electric ready, does it align with the definition that Diana put forth in her presentation? Absolutely. Uh, we see electric ready as, as part of the continuum. Uh, this is a two-step process. And as we've seen, and I think you know, what we're seeing even in New York City is that you know, not every building is immediately ready to electrify, uh, even in new construction. So we have an opportunity to put those buildings on a pathway, get them electric ready, get the conduit in the right places, plugs in the right places, make sure that when th that equipment gets switched out in the future, it's easier, it's cheaper uh, to do that uh, because, again, you all know this, but it's much easier to do all of this when the walls are open, when the building's under construction, uh, than it is to try to tear them out and do it at the end. So you know, that's definitely, we follow the same approach um, and you know, we see it really as a continuum, what we can do now with electric ready and then what we wanna do uh, in the future uh, with electric. Great, thank you. Um, so this electric ready two-step process, right? We've got some consistency amongst the code overlay, how the state is viewing this. Um, I wanna turn to New York City for a second where we've kind of jumped past that initial electric ready state and we're going all in on this idea of new construction being fully electric. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with Local Law 154, recently passed last year, which effectively um, is going to be phasing out fossil fuel-based systems in New York City in some uh, typologies as early as 2024. And so I wanna talk with Emily here for a second, specifically about how the city is preparing to go right to that fully electrified state. Sure, thanks Molly. Um, I actually have a slide of all the different dates in um, Local Law 154. Sorry, just give us a minute. Um, so Local Law 154, as you've heard of, you know, many of the presenters have spoken about it already. It's requiring electrification in new construction. Um, but within that law, there are several compliance dates. Um, and these compliance dates reflect, you know, when, when, when an application for new construction is submitted to, um, to the buildings department, um, when those have to be electric buildings. So you'll see the first compliance date here is January 1st, 2024. So if an application for new construction or what we call in the buildings department an alt CO new building with existing elements, if one of those applications is filed with the department on that date or later, um, it has to be all electric if it is a group R3 building. So this is one and two family homes. Um, so that, that's only a year and a half from now. So one and two family homes a year and a half from now will be required to be all electric. Um, also, you see the second bullet, all other construction, so all other occupancies that are seven stories and less, um, also will have to be all electric with the exception of service water heating equipment. So the service water heating equipment gets delayed until, if you, if you jump ahead, that July 2nd, 2027. So it's about five years from now when service water heating equipment, um, you know, will, will have that compliance date. Um, so if I look at the, you know, if I look at this timeline, um, you'll see the second bullet is for the School Construction Authority. Their compliance date is December 31st, 2024. Um, and then affordable housing um, is about a year later, December 31st, 2025. Um, and then the big compliance date for, you know, for basically all construction in New York City is July 2nd, 2027. Um, so that's when all occupancies, um, so the building seven stories, seven stories and greater and all service water heating equipment, that's when everything will be required to be all electric. Um, and then with the exclusion of affordable housing uh, six months later on December 31st. Um, so, you know, we see this progressive timeline. So while we're going all electric, we're also not going all electric for all buildings at the same time. Um, and what's not shown on the screen that Chris touched on are the two code updates. So there's a code update that will happen, you know, probably before, definitely before this compliance date shown on the screen. So sometime in 2023, um, where we're mandated to adopt the stretch code. I'm sure we'll get into that in later discussion. Um, and, then, and then we have another code that we're required to adopt by law in 2025, a performance-based code. Um, so these are both, you know, 
a, another policy lever, I guess, where we can start maybe incorporating electric ready for these buildings that have a five-year timeline from now, say. So, um, you know, so we're, we're working on that. Those are all the things that we're working on in place. Great, thank you. That's a great overview. Um, and I really appreciate the timeline here. I think it really kind of lays out the phasing of something like Local Out 154. Um, so based on this, let's go back to Chris for a second here. Um, you know, New York City is taken on these really, you know, sort of forward thinking mandates, 154, of course, Local Law 97, which we heard quite a bit about um, earlier on, and there are a number of other initiatives out there at the city level. Can you tell us a little bit about how the state is thinking about building electrification in the short and long term? And as a follow-up, what we might expect from the state in terms of codes uh, to support these, these goals and policy efforts? Absolutely. So the state of New York is lagging a little bit behind New York City. New York City sets, sets the uh, precedent for, for the state. Uh, and we're fortunate to have the, 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 the leadership here um, in the city. What the state's looking to do really is to advance energy code as quickly as possible. Just a couple weeks ago, we passed, uh, there was a, a law that was passed uh, that's gonna require the, uh, the energy code to advance faster than the model code. So you're, you're hearing you know, the about the development of 2024, uh, other states adopting 2021. We are looking to help to drive that, that forward in the state. So we've, we're, we've been working for the last few years on uh, developing stretch codes. We developed stretch 2020, uh, which is in effect right now in, in New York City. Uh, we're working on stretch 2023 as well. Um, and again, that's something that we look to to help drive a more efficient, the most efficient possible uh, uh, building uh, in new construction. The, you know, the one thing that, uh, you know, that Energy Code is really good at uh, is, is efficiency and the envelope. Um, really, when it comes down to it, Energy Code does that better than almost any any lever that we have for new construction. Um, and so, really, the you know it's really trying to push that forward um, as much as possible, and then look to other uh, other levers, other policies uh, to help drive towards electrification. Um, so, I'm sure many of you out there have seen the Climate Action Council and some of the scoping plan work that that's been uh, that's been publicized over the last six months to a year. Uh, both, uh, both the Climate Action Council as well as Governor Hochul have highlighted going electric as one of the most important things for buildings. Uh, there's in the Climate Action Council, uh, the scoping plan has set out some dates uh, similar to what New York City has. Um, obviously, this is draft at this point. Uh, we'll, look, we'll certainly look to see what it is uh, when it comes out and it's finalized next year. But we do expect that at the state level, there's going to be some deadlines coming up um, in this next decade that say new construction has to be all electric uh, before a certain date. Uh, still to be determined, um, and still in process. To your question, Molly, about existing buildings. Uh, existing buildings, as I mentioned, it's, it's a lot tougher with energy code. And the way that energy code is, is uh, situated in the laws of New York State, um, again, it does a great job for new construction. We can do a lot and we can really move, uh, move things forward. But we're going to have to look to other, uh, other uh, uh, policies, uh, other levers, um, other ways to drive efficiency uh, and electrification in existing buildings. Uh, so, you know, obviously local law is, an, is a great example of that for large buildings uh, that New York City's uh, passed. Uh, but there's also other ways to, to look at that as well. Things like appliance standards uh, and, and, you know, looking at how we, those can be extended out uh, across the state. So the answer is, you know, there's, it's kind of an all bringing everything to bear, uh, trying to figure out how to push in that direction. The final answer is going to be an efficient building uh, that is electrified. Uh, the question is when, you know, when that happens and how it happens. So if you want to future proof your, your new construction now, go all electric and go efficient. Thank you for that answer. I think that was super clear. Um, and it sounds like if you want anybody to take anything away, it's that point, right? A highly electric or a highly efficient building you know, headed towards electrification sooner rather than later is the best way to future proof. That's exactly right. Um, so on that point, right, where I think there's probably pretty broad agreement that that's a good strategy, I want to talk a little bit about something that tends to be sticky, which is cost. Uh, and I want to commend Diana and, and the resources that have been put together as part of the decarb overlay, which include resources around cost. You know, we saw that, that cost case study specifically around a single family household and then a medium sized building. Um, you know, there's not a lot of information just yet about cost, so those are, are really helpful metrics. I do notice, however, that here in New York City we have an abundance of large commercial buildings. And so I want to pose the question really to everybody here, 
how are we thinking about the cost to electrify large new construction and then to you know, throw an extra little sticky bit in their existing buildings that are in the large commercial space? And I'll open it up to whoever would like to take that tricky question first. So I'll jump in there. Um, one thing I didn't mention about Local Law 154 is that two reports are required in that law. One of the reports is a heat pump feasibility study. And you know that, that report is, um, you know, it's, con it's supposed to be conducted by the mayor's office. It's due next June, so just about a year from now. Um, and what they're going to be looking at is the feasibility of different type of heat pump technologies in different building typologies, looking at that seven stories and below, or below seven stories, seven stories and above, um, and looking at cost implementation um, and also cost of use. So I think we're going to get a lot of information, you know, it's, it'll be an information gathering exercise and um, it'll be available publicly. So I think we'll get a lot more information out of, out of that study that comes out in a year. Fun. Okay. <laughs> so we released the cost study a few months ago. We're actually considering, hoping to expand it um, to other climate zones, possibly other building types as well. Um, and I'm hoping also do the energy modeling and the life cycle cost analysis for those other building types. But we're looking for funding. So if we find that funding, find a funder, we will do it. Um, but it, yeah, it's something we want to do that we think can further electrification further electrification across the entire country. Awesome. And at the state level, we, whenever we put forward a proposal for a code update, especially an energy code update, we are always looking at cost. Part of the, our proposals, when, you know, whenever we, we finalize them, will be cost effectiveness tests, looking at life cycle cost, um, looking at first cost, and really understanding that across building types, across climate zones, uh, and, and, and across applications. So. You know, it'll it'll be baked in to the process, uh, but you know, and and of course we we really view it as an essential piece uh, of the puzzle. You know, up to you know up till now, and actually still to this uh, to to this date, New York State has a ten year uh, ten year payback threshold for anything in energy code. Um, that is likely to change under the under the new uh, legislation. Really looking more at the life cycle cost, and so that's one of those pieces I think you know as we look ahead, uh, they can really help with electrification. Um, you know, thinking about it across the the whole life of the building ins instead of just putting it into a ten a ten year payback. Either way, that is all part of the process. It is it'll be public. It'll be you know is included in all the regulatory filings because um, we want to make sure that folks know uh, what it is that we're getting into. Yes, I think that information is going to be very important. It's very encouraging to hear from everybody uh, on the panel here that they have that in mind, and that's going to be part of the information that's forthcoming. Um, I guess sort of a, a last question that I have prepared here for everybody, and then we'll turn over to the questions that have been put forth by the audience here, um, is also about you know provisions in something like a, a decarb overlay that are tricky to fit into the New York City environment. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about renewables, right? That was identified as one of the primary sort of requirements that would hopefully be, you know, undertaken as, as part of the, the overlay. And so my last question is, is targeted toward Emily, but really anybody feel free to answer here. Um, you know, from the point of the Department of Buildings, how do you look at something like a decarb overlay that has something required renewable energy and kind of make it work within the context of the New York City environment where that's a harder thing to actually accomplish given, you know, the size of our buildings and available footprint? That's a really good question, Molly. Um, so I, I just want to touch on what New York City has already done in the legislation that we've passed um, that kind of goes in line with what Diana was talking about with the deep guard code. So in part of the, part of the, um, you know, we, I'm trying to remember, I think it was part of the Climate Mobilization Act, Local Laws 92 and 94 passed, requiring renewables on, or solar on, on rooftops. Um, you can also install green roof, but the most cost-effective op option is solar, and so that's what we're seeing. So that's required for all new roofs in New York City. That's um, single-family homes to skyscrapers. Um, so that's already a requirement. Uh, we've had electric vehicle ready in the code for quite some time for, new co for commercial uh, parking garages, parking lots. Um, the 2020 Energy Code, which adopted the stretch code, um, also requires uh, electric vehicle ready in residential homes. So that's been a requirement since um, 2020 as well. And, you know, one big component of the decarb code is energy efficiency. And, uh, you know, we, we do have one of the most 
energy efficient codes in the country and we'll be adopting the 2023 stretch code later, either probably early next year, um, timeline's still up in the air. Um, but we're gonna make very aggressive moves to um, energy efficiency on the new construction front. Um, I think you know some of the things that we have to look at tackling still are energy storage and um, you know the the grid controls. Um, so you know I think it's really it's really great that that's moving forward in the 2024 IECC process. Um, and um, you know and just to throw it out there that we will be we will be modifying you know we'll be having a call for our energy code advisory committee later this year and so these are topics that we can we can look at and in, you know talk about incorporating into our code for next year whether or not they come into stretch um, all you know that's all of this is under development right now so I encourage all of you all of you are the experts in the room to join our energy code advisory committee and provide us your input on the best way to you know tackle this and get the decarb code you know into New York City what makes sense now Thank you for that answer. Okay, um, I think from here, th we've got some great questions in the queue, so I'm gonna go ahead and just jump in, and uh, whoever would like to take the lead on it, please feel free. Uh, although I think this first one is probably pretty clearly for Emily. Um, what tools does the DOB and the city need for the design community to be able to meet energy code and local law 97 requirements? All right, so we have two separate things happening. We have the en energy code and local law 97. So I think typically in the past, um, you know, energy code, energy code is triggered when you're doing work in your building, right? And so, you know, you easily follow the code. Um, you know, the tools that we are looking at for code, um, you know, when we're going towards an aggressive, an aggressive code is making sure that, you know, any new concepts that we have in the code, um, that we, we are explaining and educating to the design community clearly, and, um, you know, and clearly showing how you would demonstrate compliance on plans. Um, so I realize this is not a very specific answer, but we're still under the code development, so it's a little bit you know, we can't be too specific until we know what the code is looking like. Um, and then, you know, as far as local law 97, um, I'm not sure that we're there yet or if I can even speak to that at this moment. Um, but one of the, I just want to point out that, w you know, one of the things that we did to try to align the current code with what 97 is requiring is, you know, if you're doing an energy model for, um, con for compliance, uh, we have we have built in there a, a local I-97 calculator. So it takes the you know the um, the performance usage and it converts it to uh, carbon dioxide. And based on your you know occupancy in the building, the proposed occupancy categories, it, it calculates your limit. So you're able to see what the limit is and what your anticipated carbon emissions would be. Um, so that's just something that we've done. So, you know, we've been forward thinking and, you know, collaborative and, you know, and, and like I said, we do, we do take suggestions from the design community and when we have an advisory committee for energy code, I think it's really important to talk about enforcement and compliance and tools that are needed. Um, we, we have a strong relationship with um, the Pacific Northwest National Lab and you know they are the developers of ComCheck and ResCheck. Um, we are implementing a pilot program with them to look how to implement our 2025 performance code. So lots of things are happening. Lots of tools are under consideration. Um, a lot of you have been engaged in our pilot program. Um, so you know we we really we really encourage the design community to you know participate in any sort of um, you know, um, outreach that we're doing and programs that we have. I, I would just second that, uh, w uh, what Emily said. I mean, w it, we really need your help as well to identify some of the tools and resources that are gonna help us get there. You know, the ComCheck, ResCheck, uh, energy code trainings that Urban Green and others do, uh, you know, other, other tools that are, that are out there, you know, th that's almost table stakes, but we, we know there's gonna need to be more as we have a more advanced code and we have, you know, and we move to performance-based codes. Uh, let us know, let us know what we can do to help, what resources we can, we can build, 
Um, our stretch effort is going to include a committee that, that's actually working and identifying those, those tools and resources as well, but you know, all, all uh, suggestions are, are helpful. This is sort of a follow-up question um, to that. If, if there are members here and you know, in other circles that are interested in getting involved, right? how do they become involved? Is it looking specifically for communications from these different groups that are making these decisions, or can they go somewhere to see what opportunities are available? I can sorry. <laughs> I can specifically talk about um, you know what we do with Department of Buildings. We do um, when we're looking for an it for when we do a call for our committee participants. Um, you know we'll do outreach from the department. We'll post on our website. Um, you know if you we'll do kind of a mass mailing. We have sustainability newsletters. We have my buildings newsletters. So you know read that coming forth. We have. Social media, um, you know, if you follow DOB on Twitter, they'll be posting on that. Um, so, you know, encourage encourage you to just look at the outreach there. And yeah, great. Okay, um, so this is kind of an interesting question here. I, I think um, it's a, an interesting point, and hopefully, we'll have some good discussion around it here. Um, how do we make sure that? electrify new construction buildings are doing the right thing, right? Let's say they're following the code, they're fully electrified. How do we make sure that they're actually more efficient and that they're working the way that we intend them to work through our codes? All right, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, so one of the, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is in 2025, by Local Law 32, we're required to have a performance-based code. Um, performance-based is loosely defined, but it does say it, the code has to be based on a metric and a target. Um, metric and target are not defined as well either. However, you know, in if you think about a performance-based code, you're looking at what the outcome will be of all the systems in that building. So how we get there, that's how we're looking in the future. That's what these pilot programs are geared to. How can we develop these tools um, you know, so that we're not having a building with all, all electric resistance heating? That's not what we want to get to. Um, so you know, we're thinking about that. We're looking at tools where you know, we're not maybe not requiring everybody to do a traditional energy model to determine what that performance is. Um, I think it's really important that we need, uh, we need readily, going back to the tools, readily available to tools, um, easier to use and easier to enforce where we're getting the real outcome of, of really good buildings. So, and I think the code maybe needs a backstops in there, so. I would agree on the, on the backstops. I would say, you know, further, uh, the, you know, just, we can push forward code, you know, as as a in, in theory, but it's really about how you all build and maintain the building in, in the end. So, you know, trying to make sure that we have you know sufficient compliance resources, you know, for you know for practitioners um, as well as building officials. Uh, you know, it's Department of Buildings here in New York City is a very different uh, situation than the Department of Buildings in say Plattsburgh. Um, obviously, we're dealing with that acro across the state, uh, but the levels of resources vary tremendously. So. Uh, looking at how, you know, I started looking at how we can help um, everyone uh, across the board. You know, and recently we've just launched some dynamic compliance checklists, uh, you know, for, for both the stretch code and, and the base code for the, for the state, making it hopefully easier for practitioners to, you know, go through and, and make sure that, you know, they're complying uh, with each part uh, of, the, of the applicable code. We're also launching, we've just launched a third party, uh, a third party uh, compliance and inspection pilot uh, for the rest of the state. Uh, so that we can, you know, help support these code officials who we know are swamped, um, who don't have time to always get to the energy code compliance to make sure that it's actually at a basic minimum level hitting those those performance, uh, you know, as designed. Uh, so we've launched that across the state. We have we have uh, uh, municipalities that are already adopting it, um, and you know, so we're looking to expand that further. The other thing that we're, we are doing, and this is, you know, it, it seems a little crazy to say this, but um, we're just help, we're trying to help municipalities across the state get online um, with their permitting. Uh, you know, we, so many building you know, departments are still just totally paper-based. Um, you know, and so just, even just the basics of being able to get all of those, you know, those departments online, make it easier for, you know, for submissions, to make, make it easier to, to show where the process is, uh, and, and what's missing, you know, instead of just filing and you know, sending it in and hoping it, it, gets, it gets through the process. So 
Uh, all of those areas are, are kind of ways that, New York, that NYSERDA and the state can help uh, municipalities, mainly outside of New York City, uh, to really grow their resources, help with compliance, um, and make sure that you know, the building gets built right at, from, at the beginning. To add a few more points, um, yesterday I was in a uh, meeting for the IACC and the Residential Energy Code Committee was considering a, a proposal that would um, outlaw electric resistance heating for as the main source of heating in a residential building, and that subcommittee approved it. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, through codes we can can encourage people not to use the least efficient heating source and move to heat pumps. Um, I would also say, also say on the commercial code, the um, commercial committee approved a proposal by DOE that would require um, buildings to reach a certain number of points in the energy code, and that point structure incentivizes more efficient HVAC systems and envelopes and lighting systems. Um, and I, because the code cannot, it's, it's hard for the code to mandate more efficient systems because the federal appliance standards say that states can adopt more efficient standards than it, that is adopted by the federal government. So that's one way the codes are kind of getting away, <laughs> getting um, around that sort of um, federal preemption problem. Jumping in on federal preemption because it's one of my favorite topics. Uh, Isn't it everybody's? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, you know, we are we are we, we're fortunate now that um, the current administration in Washington, you know, has really taken appliance standards seriously. Uh, you know, they they just sat uh, or went backwards for four years. Um, right now, you know, the DOE uh, in Washington is pushing forward a hundred different actions on appliances this year alone, and they're planning on adopt, uh, updating, I think, sixty different standards before the end of 2024. That's going to help us a lot. You know, that brings that baseline uh, that is you know, where codes preempt us, it brings the baseline equipment up. And that's gonna affect you know, furnaces, it's gonna, affect, uh, it's gonna affect heat pumps, it's gonna affect rooftop units. This is something that is gonna affect across the board. It's, it's a niche area, but uh, let me tell you, the, the impacts of that, uh, that minimally compliant equipment um, are at the federal level are really dramatic and I think will help us here in the state. Great, I'm glad we got everybody in on that one and it wasn't just focused on Emily there, so. Good question, shout out to whoever put that one forward. Um, here's another one that hopefully uh, we can all kind of weigh in on here. In, in your view, what role do you think the utilities play, right, in, a, in sort of helping us as building professionals, as code professionals, um, actually move the building stock, both new and, and existing, toward an electrified future? Who would like to start with this? <laughs> Happy to start on this one. The utilities have amazing programs around the state to incentivize more efficient, electrified, lower GHG emissions uh, buildings. The heat pump, the, the Clean Heat New York program um, has, has, you know, has been ad adopted statewide. It's driving adoption. Really, you know, as, as you know, utility programs do a good job of providing that carrot, giving that incentive to go above and beyond. You know, take not just adopting the minimally compliant uh, equipment. Uh, I would say also they do a great job on, it, on the existing building stock. You know, that's the majority of what they're dealing with. So um, they, they can really help create a market um, and drive the, drive the market to uh, improve its efficiency, you know, whether that's you know, switching from standard, uh, standard water heaters to heat pump water heaters um, or you know, switching over to, to heat pumps more broadly. Um, you know, really, they can help make that jump uh, with their incentives. Any other thoughts or shall we move on? All right. Um, I, I think I have one that, that maybe you can start with here, Diana, and it's, it's specifically about maybe future code overlays or thoughts on specifically embodied carbon, which I think you mentioned is included in what you currently have, uh, and then also refrigerant management, right? To take that a little bit of a step further, everybody's talking about heat pumps, uh, but there's a lot of movement right now about what to do with refrigerants and the role that they play in climate change. I will take that question. Um, so our current, unfortunately, our current decarb code overlay does not include any embodied carbon requirements. Um, it's focused on an overlay to the energy code. We are working on embodied carbon code requirements, actually. Um, and unfortunately, it's not for refrigerants yet. We're working on embodied carbon code requirements for uh, steel and concrete. And we're trying to get those into the um, international building code 
Uh, we proposed that in um, March of this year. Unfortunately, that proposal failed. It was not adopted for the next version of the IBC. But we're getting lots of industry feedback. We're also proposing it in many um, states and cities across the country are, are starting to think about embodied carbon and are approaching us and wondering how they can regulate that better. So we are um, hoping to get some local adoption and some socialization of those concepts to um, get it into the national codes in the future. Um, we are hoping to work on refrigerants soon, though. Hi, on, with, with the uh, embodied carbon issue, uh, you know, as, as Diana said, energy code is not a great place for it. Um, it doesn't work well in the structure of, of the energy code. Um, you know, I think at the state level, we're looking to see where, where can it be uh, deployed and what, you know, what it makes the most sense in the short run, knowing that you know, we're looking at a code update in the next three years. Um, obviously, the state and others have taken a lead, on, you know, leading by example with things like concrete at the Port Authority um, and, and in other agencies. You know, those are kinds of things that we, you know, we have New York emissions, you know, a ton of concrete that's manufactured um, in the state. Um, and we also know that we use a lot of it with our agencies. So, you know, helping to drive it there, starting to create those markets so that, you know, then w once regulations come in later, um, it's, you know, there's a robust market already there to support it. On the refrigerant front, uh, you know, the, the one thing I would, I would just note, uh, one of the, the pieces of legislation that just passed a couple weeks ago um, was allowing New York State to even start to deploy things like, uh, things like A2L refrigerants, things that you know, have a slightly higher you know, flammability but are going to be essential when we start to shift to low global warming potential uh, refrigerants. Um, as, uh, up, as of now, the New, uh, New York State really can't require those, uh, but now moving forward, once that legislation is signed, um, that's going to really open up a door for a lot of in a lot of applications. At, at the buildings department, um, you know, we we work closely closely with our other construction codes unit, so you know, we're we're just in the early stages of looking at what those lower global warming potential refrigerants, you know how they would fit into the structure of, of, you know, codes allowing them. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let's see. We've got another good one here. As codes start to mandate EV chargers, and I think this also goes for other demand flexibility you know, components here, um, how is the city, and I, I suppose this could be for the state too, but, but how are we dealing with the issue of standards and proprietary systems? Um, and additionally, this kind of goes back to my question earlier about solar, some of the challenges just associated with getting some of this stuff in buildings in a city like New York. Now, that, that could refer to EV chargers specifically where street parking is a thing. Just curious, and uh, Anonymous is also curious to know how we're dealing with those kinds of issues. I think, you know, when, when we're, man so right, right now, right, the code just, has um, EV capable, it doesn't require chargers. But once we start getting to requiring chargers, I think we just have to be mindful that we're not, um, you know, that certain safety standards are in place and that we're not, um, you know, preventing a hurdle for certain systems that maybe we haven't thought of, um, you know, from being installed in buildings. So, you know, that's kind of where we look at. We wanna make sure that it's safe to be installed and, you know, that we, that either it's, um, you know, if it's, you know, a different, you know, different technology or something on the forefront that there's a means to come to the department for, you know, approval um, if it's not specifically called out in the code. I hope that answered the question. It sounded good to me. Um, all right, let's see here. Enter, well, no. What, what else do we have here? Oh, here we go. Is there a concern that an electric ready building may install under oversized electrical infrastructure as technology changes so often? So I think this is actually a really good question. And I would argue that one of the uh, things that I often hear as a service provider is I'm worried about in installing something that will make my building electric ready because what happens 10 years from now when everything changes? So maybe we could talk about that for a second, right? What, what, what do we say to folks who have that concern? Off. So, I the the technology for um, water heaters and HVAC systems is not advancing that quickly. <laughs> that it's going to be completely different when the um, when a building might try to install new combustion new equipment. I mean, we have a climate emergency. We have to get to net zero carbon as a 
country by 2050, that's only in 30 years, we have the technologies in place. The electrical requirements of those technologies aren't gonna change drastically. Um, so our electric ready uh, code, for example, it requires a space and condensate drain and an outlet for a future heat pump water heater. Heat pump water heaters are already out there. We know what they look like. We know they use a 240 volt outlet. They're not gonna change. We're hoping future heat pump water heaters might use 120 volt outlets. Um, that would be nice. But the ones currently on the market um, will continue to be available in the future. Um, so I'm not personally concerned about that. I, I don't think it's gonna be like hotels installing um, infrastructure for internet cables and then everything goes wireless. I don't think that's gonna happen with heat pump water heaters and HVAC systems. I agree on that point. I, I would say, I mean, so much of this is just no regrets strategies that, you know, building the building the right way, putting in things so that we're ready to make even the most basic uh, of jumps in, in the coming years um, is really, you know, what we're, you know, what we're trying to do with, with electric ready and a lot of these provisions. The other piece of the question, I think, is, is around, you know, things like sizing and, and, and that. I mean, a lot of that goes back to, you know, working with the market, educating the market, working with manufacturers, making sure that the folks on the ground that are installing these and maintaining these are putting in the right equipment at the front end, not oversizing, not undersizing, um, and giving them the tools to do it right. Um, so figuring that out, uh, you know, how we can help them, really, you know, pushing forward uh, with consistent guidelines that can be able to deploy not only in New York State, but nationally, uh, so that there are best practices uh, to, to make sure that we're getting, we're sizing uh, equipment the right way now and also for the future. Yeah, and I'll actually add a point to that too, just on the commercial side, right, these large buildings do a lot of work in, very similar principles for electric ready and preparing, right, space, understanding the electrical infrastructure impacts and planning for those up front. Um, it's a thing that providers are comfortable doing and can do as part of the process future-proofing these buildings for an electrified future. So I think, uh, I think with that, we have time for maybe one more question here, and we'll close out. Um, I, I'll give you guys a moment here to prepare, but the final question I'm going to ask after I ask one more here is, you know, if there's one thing you want folks to take away from this session, what would you like it to be? But before that... <laughs> You know, I think this is a good a good final question from the audience. Um, case studies. Where are all the case studies for heat pumps? We hear so much about heat pumps and how they're the future. Where can we go to find solid case studies um, to give us a sense of, of how to implement these in the right way? It's a great question. And, you know, the good news is we're seeing heat pumps deployed across internationally across the world. I mean, in cold climates in Northern Europe, um, they are consistently uh, deployed. Um, we know that these work. Uh, we know that these work in New York in both cold climates and in, 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 uh, up in you know, North Country, but also you know, down here in, in New York City in Climate Zone 4. Um, we've, seen them, we've seen them working in Maine, uh, where you, they, they're installing tens of thousands of them in, in homes. Uh, what we've also seen is on new construction, we're seeing the design you know, really shift. Uh, we're, if you look at our program, the Buildings of Excellence program, um, we're seeing new net zero energy, all electric buildings that are being designed and being, you know, uh, being commissioned and are in the, in the market now. And the, you know, the costs for them you know, are, are, are marginal. Uh, so we have the case, we have the case studies. Um, we've done you know we've seen a lot of work, and you know honestly, in some of these cases, we're behind many other countries in adopting the, this technology. So we can we can be uh, we can feel safe in, in in making that jump. Yeah, I think we'll start to see hopefully more case studies too as this starts to get deployed at scale here in New York, which is certainly where we're headed. Uh, okay, so final question before we close out: What would you like everybody to leave here today with after this discussion? As I mentioned at the end of my, or towards the end of my presentation, um, Emily and I are on the committee for the 2024 IECC update, and that committee is releasing a draft code in August for public comment. So if you would like to be involved in, um, in commenting and reviewing the code language that has been incorporated into the draft version of the 2024 ICC, I would encourage you to get involved in that process. We need all the technical help we can get to make uh, sure these requirements are feasible in, uh, for new construction and existing buildings. I've, I've already mentioned this before, but um, 
if you are interested in becoming involved in codes, um, please look, please join our advisory committee. We need expertise. And I think, you know, one, one area that we really need to, you know, focus on is existing building, right? We have 97 that's looking at the operations, but that's 25,000 square feet and greater right now, you know, we don't have a mechanism right now for the smaller buildings. So if you have ideas on what to put in the code and how to do that with case studies and you know maybe example projects that you've worked on, real costs, um, you know those that all that information is extremely valuable. and um, you know we a hundred percent rely on your expertise and um, and work. Thanks. If you're looking to future proof your building, and you want to make sure that regardless of what the, the codes and, and standards in New York State, uh, City say, New York State say, uh, down the road, five, 10 years, uh, building the most efficient building possible uh, that's electric is going to put you on that path. Uh, so all electric, most efficient, drive efficiency. That's the really, you know, the one thing that we know we can control now uh, and that we are 100% are, are certain is going to always pay off in the end. Great, so thank you again to our panel here, and I believe that's gonna be it for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, that, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'll let you guys exit stage left or right, whatever it is. I, before we let you off for a break, we really want to recognize how grateful we are to our sponsors. And uh, we'd like to specifically thank Carrier and close our first session with a brief message from them. Confidence is at the heart of everything we do at Carrier. Our systems fill buildings and homes with healthy, clean air. We detect and put out fires and help people stay safe and secure inside. Our innovations keep foods and life-saving medicines cold and fresh until they reach those who need them. At Carrier, we create solutions to help you build a brighter future. Inspiring confidence. Carrier.